All right, welcome back, everybody, to Living Jewishly. We're on page 50 in the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. And we have over here on Simon, 6, Simon Vav, Halacha, Zion, Halacha 7. Okay. Chayav Adam Levarach Bechol Yom Mea Brachos Lefachos. A person is obligated to bless up. Bless Hashem each day with at least 100 blessings. And for anyone who was part of the class yesterday, we mentioned this very halacha. No coincidence. In fact, the halacha says, uh, the, the, our sages tell us that if someone is learning two different things and they both coincide in wisdom, it's a very, very special heavenly, uh, it's called a simon, a very special heavenly uh indication that God loves the learning that you're doing. So congratulations to all of you, right? It's a special thing that we're, okay. So we're supposed to say a hundred blessings every day. And King David instituted this practice, Remez Ladover, but it's not enough for him to just start a practice. He has to have a proof for it. See, he brings an allusion to this institution of King David. This can be found in the verse in Samuel's 2, uh, chapter 23, verse 1. It says as follows. Described as the words of King David as the words of a man established on high. Al gematria mea. What is all? The word al, on high, has a numeric value of 100. Thus, the verse alludes to King David as the man who established the enactment of reciting 100 blessings every day. Usmach min Torah, and where do we have a reference to this from the Torah? Where is a scriptural allusion to this practice? Can also be found in the Torah, in the verse in Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. Ve'ata Yisrael ma Hashem me'imach. And now Israel, what? Ma? What does Hashem, your God, ask of you? But to fear Hashem and to love Him. Do not pronounce the word ma as in what does Hashem, but rather mea, which is 100 Hashem asks of you. This refers to the 100 blessings that one is supposed to recite every day. To bring one to fear of Hashem and to love Hashem. What happens when one blesses God for anything? Uh, someone uh, is thanking God for uh, vision. Someone is blessing God for health. Someone is blessing. You're thanking God. What you do is it does a number of things. The first thing it does is it puts fear into a person. What does it mean, fear? Fear doesn't mean trembling. Fear means having the proper perspective of understanding that everything is in the hands of Hashem. Every single thing that happens to us in our daily lives, Hashem has the ability to shut it down in a second. You know how? Oh, God forbid someone can have uh, d difficulty breathing and suddenly no more Mr. Big Shot. Right? Even a football player who's so strong and so fit like yesterday, right? At the game, you saw that? The guy got, got, got a hit with the helmet, right? Done. He's on a stretcher, can't move. Can't move. Like that. Right? So it's not to fear to be trembling. That would be a very high level. But the idea is to put into perspective that we're very, very vulnerable at every state, stage in life. So when we have, so that's number one. The second part of the benefit of saying these hundred blessings is that we are able to love Hashem. When you realize that someone does something for you that they don't need to do, that's a sign of love. A luxury is a sign of love. Every ability that we have that's beyond the necessity is a sign of love. Every food that we have that's beyond bread and water is a sign of love. Because apples and oranges are a luxury. God gives it to us because he loves us. When we recognize all of the goodness, all of the kindness that Hashem bestows upon us, we 
you say, wow, I got to love him back. Okay? So it brings a person to love. That brings one to fear of Hashem and to love, love him. And to remember him constantly through the blessings that we recite. So what happens when we recite a blessing? Right? We're able to feel that connection with God at all times. It is a special, something I'm learning now with my study partner on Monday nights after class. I have a partner, a study partner I learn with at, at home. And uh, we were recently talking about a special level of connection to Hashem that we actually talked about in the Musa program last year where we did the Mesilat Yisharim. We, we, we went through the entire book of the Path of the Just, the Ways of the Upright. And one of them is Dvekut. One of the steps are Dvekut. Dvekut means to cleave to the Almighty. To cleave to the Almighty. What does it mean to cleave to the Meaning that you're so close to God in a sense that you feel a connection with God in every part of your day, in everything that happens. Because it's very easy for us to get, you know, let's say we watch the football game, right? Are we thinking about God then? No, I'm watching the football game. I'm, I'm busy with the football game, right? When I'm busy doing something, I may not, right? But the more a person works on dvekut, which is that closeness to Hashem, and focusing on that relationship, then even when he's in, in, in obscure situations, not ordinary situations, he'll still have that ability to connect himself and always stay focused on that relationship with God. That's a very, a very, now, how, what helps us get to that level and maintain that level? Blessings. When we bless and thank God, and what we do with the blessing we mentioned yesterday is we recognize how blessed we are. When we recognize how blessed we are, suddenly it's a different story. Okay, so Haklolos Shevem Mishnah Torah Hein Tishim Mushmona. Furthermore, there are ninety-eight curses set forth in the section of the admonitions in Mishnah Torah in, in the book of Deuteronomy. Vichi Vichsev Gam Kol Choli V'Chol Machala Loi Avi Alechem. In addition to these curses, it is written, and also any illness and any blow that is not written in this book. Hashem will bring upon you, any illness and blow adds an additional two curses upon the 98 that are written. Thus, bringing the total to 100. The 100 blessings that we recite every day shield us and protect us from those 100 curses that are in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, so each blessing that we say, when we go through our day, we have the Amidah, for example. The Amidah has 19 blessings. So right there, you're almost at 60. One, two, three, right? The morning, afternoon, evening. We're almost at 60. You have about 28 blessings in the morning when we wake up. Ani filat yadayim, asher yatsar, the blessings of the Torah, the blessings, right? All the morning blessings that we say about the rooster and the right, and and thank you, Hashem, for right. The, it's a beautiful blessing. All of the all of the blessings. I'll shout. I'll talk. What's that? Yeah, I'll tell you the rooster. Okay. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who gave the heart understanding to distinguish between day and night. Okay. Our sages say that it's translated, this is Art Scroll's translation, but really it means rooster. Here he says over here, uh, who gave heart to understand. The word sechvi means both heart and rooster. In the context of this blessing, both meanings are implied. The rooster crows, but man's heart reacts and understands how to deal with new situations. So when the rooster uh, gives his, uh, his, his crow, mm -hmm. we know, oh, it's morning, right? <coughs> to distinguish between day and night. 
light and darkness, which is holiness and unholy. It's a lot, lot, lot that we can confusion and clarity are all represented in day and night. I was actually, as I was driving here, I saw the beautiful moon. Yeah, oh, beautiful yeah, moon. Oh, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah. Right? But I'll, I'll just go through some of them so you, you see. Mm-hmm. Right? Blessed to you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, for not having made me a Gentile. Why? What's the difference between a person being a Jew and a Gentile? Well, We're obligated to mitzvahs. A, a, a non-Jew, does not they're not inferior. They're just not obligated to the same mitzvahs. Right? Now, well, if a Gentile observes mitzvahs, right, so what's the problem? There's no problem. Great. But our sages tell us that the reward, I'll give you an, a, an example. Dave, yes. when you were a child, think now, okay? When you were a child, who did you prefer helping out, empty out the groceries from the from their car? Your mom, mom. or your neighbor's mom? mom. Yeah? Okay, so I remember that my mom would ask me to take out the take out the groceries from the station wagon. Remember those station wagons? Mm-hmm. Right? She'd ask me to say, and I'm like, oh, really? Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to slap the bags in. Uh, all right. But my neighbor would come home and I'm like, oh, can I help you? I'll help you. Sure, no problem. <laughs> right? Right? Anybody? Anybody relate? Or I'm just the only evil one here? Right? You, Anna, you agree? Eliza? You you agree? You, yeah, you everyone okay? I don't You don't recall doing anything. But not the neighbors, not your mom's. Yeah, but my my nephew just asked me about his children, you know, that they don't want to listen to Right. Them. But we said, do they listen to their teachers? Do they listen to their friends' parents? So, the answer was yes. Okay. They so, do. So we said you're doing it right. You know? Right. So so I, I will also tell you there's a way to tell. I was just talking to my youngest son. Oh, there we go. So, so my, I was just talking to my young, youngest son, Yitzi, and my youngest daughter, Hadassah. So I said, I said, guys, let's go. If you guys want to have, what you guys want, I don't remember what they wanted. I said, just clean up the. It was after Shabbos. Clean up the living room, dining room area. It was just some toys on the floor and some shoes that needed to be put away. So, Yitzi, my son, complains to me and tells me. She's not going to help. She's not going to, right? So I said, I said, you're going to ask her. And what is she going to say? She's going to say no. I said, I'll teach you how to ask. And then she'll do it right away. You have to know how to ask. So he looks at me weird. I said, don't tell her to put away the shoes. Ask her who can put away their things faster, right? You the shoes or me the toys. And suddenly... She, you couldn't, you couldn't stop her, right? It's about, so I think that many times as parents, and then I tell him, I'm like, oh, when are you doing your job? He's like, I'm not doing it. I'm like, okay, let's see who can do it faster. He says, ah, oh, it's not going to work on me now. So it's, he, he's, he's a bright boy. But um, so, but the idea is that like this, especially in our generation, where kids are exposed to the most attractive media, possible Mm -hmm. uh it's a big problem that when we talk in 2d two dimension Mm -hmm. and they can see everything in three dimension Mm -hmm. right it's not exciting for them teachers are having a big problem with this in the classroom they're having a very big because the kids are watching sesame street or whatever it is that they're watching the yellow school bus and all of these things which is animated it's it there there are songs there's there there's a lot of uh, using their it's entertaining, it's entertaining, and they learn it's things as well, yeah, right? And then they come to a classroom, and the teacher's like, okay, everyone, take out your pencils and papers, right? I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. What happened to the whole Sesame Street? What happened to all the colors? What happened to... So it, a lot of it has to do with... Okay, so now let's get back to Shalom Asani Goy, mm-hmm. that we praise God for not making us Gentiles. The idea is, the difference is between someone who's commanded to do something and someone who's not commanded to do something. What's the difference? It's more difficult for someone who's commanded to do something than for someone who's doing it voluntarily. So the reward is greater as well for the one who does it because they're commanded. Right? Next is Shalom Sani Avet, which is, I thank, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, for not having made me a slave. And then there is a blessing for men and a blessing for women. 
Uh, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, for not having made me a woman. And then, blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, for having made me according to his will. All right? The feminists don't like that. I know, because they don't understand it. If they only understood it, and they understood the nature of mankind, they'd love it. But look look who's put on a pedestal here. Men say, thank you for not making me a woman. Women, we say, thank you, Hashem, for making me in your way. Meaning, according to your will. Which one is better? Which one is higher? Second. Much better. Right? So what are they complaining about? To be more the way God wants you to be, I think, is much higher than, thank you, God, for not making me a woman. Now, why... Why is there a difference? The problem is the feminists don't agree there's any difference to begin with. That's the problem. So let me tell you why why we say such a blessing and why the women don't say Shalah Asani Ish, that they didn't make me a man, okay? So a woman is on a pedestal. In Judaism, you see it throughout the Torah. A woman is on a pedestal. So a woman is not obligated to fulfill many of the mitzvahs because what is the purpose of a mitzvah? To get you closer to God, but they're already there, right? What did, what's the blessing women say? For having made me according to His will, they're already up there. Like my friend uses this analogy for men and women in in a, in a relationship. Uh, women are always at the top. Women are at the top of the ladder, and men are at the bottom of the ladder. And the woman's job is to get him to come up that ladder, to pull him up that ladder without falling down. You do understand it, right? Right? Men are at the bottom of the ladder and the woman's job. Why? She's where she needs to be. Do you ever see a story where a, a boy wakes up early, mows the lawn to get a few dollars so he can buy the girl that he, he has a crush on in school to buy her an ice cream? Right? Anyone ever heard of such a story? All the time. Look at Cinderella. Look at all of those, uh, you know, all of those uh, kid kid uh, shows, uh, Disney shows, right? They're all about the young guy, the prince gets on his white horse to go pick up the princess, right? So what's he doing up dressed in a white suit at seven o'clock in the morning? Well, for her, he'll, he'll make modifications. She, she's a tool through which he elevates and becomes a better person. Right? That's not demeaning. Not demeaning. What's what's the problem? You're mm -hmm. nodding no. Many problems. Yes. Men are honored to be called up to the Torah. Men are honored to become rabbis. Men count uh, for the minions. Women are relegated to sit in the back. I remember. Uh, I've been to Prague a couple, few times, mm -hmm. and I visited an old 1200th century uh, synagogue. Yeah, synagogue. I was there. Okay, if you remember, it's a small place, mm -hmm. and the congregation is in this room here, and behind the wall, behind the wall, was an opening like this. Right. Maybe one foot by one foot. The women were relegated to be. I don't like. The, I don't like the word relegated because they're not relegated. Okay, but. Well, okay, they were commissioned <laughs> to sit be, behind the wall, peering in this. In this. So I'll tell you. I'll tell you the the. You know, you're really not going to like this. Okay, but I, but listen with an open mind. In the, in the Vilna synagogue, the central synagogue in Vilna, Vilnius, uh, they built the, the beautiful uh, synagogue, beautiful building, and they had extra bricks. At the end of their construction, they were left with extra bricks. They didn't know what to do. Now, what's the problem with the extra bricks? Who paid for it? The community paid for it. You can't just throw them out. It's called Mamon Hegdish. It's holy money. It's money of charity. You can't just, right? So they asked the Gona Vilna, what do we do with this extra extra bricks? 
So the Gaon of Vilna said, put the bricks in the entranceway to the women's section. Put them in the entranceway. I said, what? We made a women's section, right? For... He said, yeah. You have to understand something. I'll explain to you what the Gaon of Vilna uh, said in a second. If you're on a, the purpose of prayer is to connect and bring you to that higher level, as we as we made in the preface, the women are already on that higher level. Okay, so they they, they don't have to get to that destination. Okay, what did the Vilna Gaon say? They asked him why why are you recommending that? He said because the majority, sadly, of what happens in the women's section of a synagogue is that the women look at each other's clothing and they become jealous those shoes and that blouse and that skirt and that wig and that you know this that and it becomes like a a uh, a meeting place of the eyes um, aside for the distraction for the men which I can we could talk about in address later but that's a very it's a very real uh it's a very real challenge that we can decide to turn a blind eye to it's just like we say I'll, I'll give you another example of, you know, recently, oh, I didn't even click record. Okay. So <laughs> recently, I, there was a story. Recently, there was a story, a very tragic story. Uh, there was a man in Israel who wrote many books, children's books. You heard about this. You probably read in the Jewish Heart Voice or... All right. I mean, we discussed it here. That's right. So I today I heard a phenomenal, phenomenal lecture about this whole story. Where the rabbi who's speaking brings the Rambam. He brings many different uh, authorities, rabbinic authorities, that conclude that this individual was an evil of all evil person. Evil of all evil. And that, according to Rambam, you take his mother and you berate her for raising such an, a despicable human being. Right? No, I'm serious. Someone who's accused of abusing other women, of, of, of abusing children. It, this is like the worst of the worst. Not only that, then he goes along to kill himself. Which is another act of, of of uh, of uh, of what? Cowardice. It's worse than cowardice. It's 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 the highest level of um, of uh, narcissism. Because what did he tell all of his victims? All of his victims. And there are recordings of this, where, for example, there was a woman who was a married woman who had an affair with this guy. Right, and she tells him, "I just, I, I just realized what happened here, and I have to come clean and get divorced from my husband, because a woman who lived with another man while she was married to her husband can't be with her husband anymore, can she?" Right. So he tells her, "Look, if you go pub public with this, I'm just going to kill myself." That's what he tells her. Now, why does someone say that? He says it to use it as a tool that it, that if he does do that, now they're going to feel more guilt, right? But there's another reason. Because he's spent his whole life building this fake image of who he is. And the minute you go public, you break that image. So he has no existence anymore. So that's the real the reality. The reality is, you go public, he, he really is dead. Because now his whole character, his whole facade that he put forward is gone. So the rabbi said something very interesting today. He said that he, a year ago, I know who he's referring to, a year ago, a very, very, very famous and prominent Jewish psychiatrist passed away. <clears throat> a religious man. And this psychiatrist treated thousands and thousands of patients. Not one of his patients was a female. Not one was a female. Why not? 
Because what happens in the relationship of a therapist and, oh, and a patient a yeah. it becomes very personal. And the patient could be very vulnerable, mostly are. When they're in such a situation, they're fragile. They could be, you know, talking about their difficult marriage. They could be talking about their difficult childhood. They could be talking about the difficult uh, children they have. Whatever it is, they're in a difficult situation, very vulnerable. Having a male therapist for a female patient is asking for trouble. It's begging for trouble. Because if we live in a world that assumes that everyone can be trusted then we have disasters like this. By the way, this guy was a therapist. This guy treated women. What did we expect? Right? And it's, it's, it's an unspoken rule. Right? There's no, I don't think there's any direct halacha that says so. I may, I may be wrong. It could be that halacha does say so. Right? But we have to understand that there are realities out there that even if we don't like them, they're still the reality, right? When you have a vulnerable actress who's 13 years old and wants to get a part in a movie, and you have a Harvey Weinstein who's ready, willing, and able to take advantage of that girl, we can hide all we want and say that was a fluke. It's not a fluke. It's not a fluke. This is the reality of what happens when, of what happens when you mix between men and women, assuming that there's no difference and everyone's just the same, everything is just fine and kumbaya, yeah. we just get along and we'll be mature. Yeah, what's the matter? I had several male doctors that were amazing. I'm sure they were. They were so kind and, and gentle and thorough and loving and just really... And professional, I'm sure. Very professional. Mm -hmm grandfatherly or whatever, but really good people. And I'm really glad I got to know them. That's excellent. But that's a that's a that's an exception to the rule. Well, I had several. Definitely. No, well, yeah. unless, unless, unless there's, unless there's a fear, uh, a fear of losing their license, something like that. But if they're big enough and they get to make the rules, you know that this guy, this scoundrel, but he was a scoundrel. And then the, the, the one second. He was in like, charge of the committee to out the molesters. <coughs> yeah. If you run the operation, then who's going to report you? Right. Yeah, he ran, he, he ran this cover for a long time. Wow. It, 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 okay, so now, what I want to get to is like this, is that... Um, we, we have to understand the differences between men and women. The biggest mistake we make is when we say that they're the same. They're not the same. They're not equal. They're, not. they're different. They're different. Okay, so if we're saying that, that, that why don't they have an equal part, they're different. They have different roles. A pitcher and a catcher and a first baseman and a second baseman and a shortstop and a third baseman. Right, all play different roles. But I want to be the same as everyone else. Well, you're different. You can't. Right? A catcher can't be a pitcher. By definition, a woman can't be a man and a man can't be a woman. It's not only because of honor. Women can put together their own minion. Women can put their together. Women can be rabbis. There's nothing wrong with that. The the only difference is, is that we what we recognize is that a woman's place is is on because okay, my example is the Queen of England. You don't see the Queen of England parading around in public. Once a year, there'll be a, you know, she'll pass in a car and she'll wave to everyone, and everyone lines up, and it's like, what's the big deal? Why can't she just like go outside and tend to her garden in front of everyone? Let her tend to her garden in front of everyone. What's the matter? There's nothing wrong with it. That's her garden, right? She's the queen. Queen, right? That's the way we see every Jewish woman. They're a queen. Even without a crown and without the uh, the duchess or the uh, whatever they call them, the prince the and the titles and the horses. 
Okay, so we have to recognize that women are on a pedestal, which is why they don't typically take public positions. Now, we did have kings uh, who were queens, who were, who, who were the leaders of the Jewish people. You had that. You had prophet, prophetesses. Right? You had that. Of course you had that. But um, notwithstanding that, we have to understand the separate roles that they play. Right? The men's role is to get busy doing mitzvahs. Because we need a routine to get us in order. Right? We have to go to shul three times a day. We have to learn Torah every day. We got to get into a routine. If you ask any woman, she'll tell you, yeah, it would be nice if my husband got into that routine, right? Because that would help him get up that ladder. But women don't need that. So that's why they're not forbidden from doing that. They're not obligated to do that. You understand the difference? Am I clear? No. No. Let me give you another example. Give me another example. Your equality. I know there's no equality, is what I'm telling you. There's no equality. It's a mistake. Okay. There is no equality. A couple of years ago, pre pandemic, we were in <coughs> Paris, okay? Yep. We went to a synagogue. Right? Yep. And the women were all the way in the back. Let me finish. Okay. In Europe, you have either Orthodox synagogues or no synagogues. Correct. You don't find reform, you don't find Correct. Service. Correct. Okay. So, of course, I went downstairs, my wife went upstairs. After the Saturday morning service, uh -huh. the men all sat along this long, long table with all sorts of delicacies and food. Kiddish. Kiddish. Uh -huh. The women were relegated. <laughs> upstairs and they may have had challah there and they couldn't go things. to Kiddush with the men? Huh? They couldn't go to Kiddush with no. the men? No. It was an orthodox synagogue. I don't know. But I'll tell you what. In my synagogue, the women have exactly the same Kiddush as the men do. Yeah, the, right? The women have the same Kiddush as the men do and the women never eat anything. Right? <laughs> it's, well, like, it's like, why do we put all that out? They don't even touch it. They're busy talking. Right, they're too busy talking to eat, even. Right, so it's not. I, I don't know about that yeah, place. I mean, yeah, the, the, I've never. I mean, you're welcome to come to my synagogue with your wife, and you'll both have the same chant. Yeah. Right, no problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but um, same no, men and women are separate. Does she get a napkin? A what? <laughs> a napkin. Of course she does. So do you. <laughs> She gets what you get. She gets also, by the way, we also put the, the bourbon and the scotch by the women too. <laughs> right? They don't they don't drink it, but that's their choice. eliza has been there, right? Eliza knows what it's like. Right? This gets a great kiddish. Right? But um, but the idea here is like this. The idea is is that we 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 have to realize that the reality of life is different than what the media has been telling us. Men and women are not equal and they're not the same. Not even close. Except for all right, Reverend. All right, you agree now or not? Not so much. We're the same. Women, men and women are the same, or not? Um, they're not the same. They're not the same. There aren't too many professional football players that are women. That's correct. That's correct. They only have uh, now. They have some referees that are that are female. And right. reporters in the locker. And reporters in the locker. Right, but that's just that's just to to, to uh, who wants to listen to some woman ask questions? I, well, that I, drives me nuts. I, the women in well, the I don't mind that. I don't. I don't. Think, I don't think there's a problem with that. You know, but I, I ponder. Yeah, you ponder. But you're saying a little bit, and I have oh. a little problem with it. But not you. Just the problem with the You're going to find men that are going to do this regardless if they're separated, because some men have that nature in them. Okay. Okay. So what you were saying is we have to separate them so this doesn't happen. No. Even when you don't separate them, even when you separate them, it's still going to happen. A hundred percent. But right, a hundred percent. You'll always have people. Yeah, a hundred percent on that. Right. Even when you separate them, you'll have problems. Of course, that's the reality with every situation. 
Right? You'll have people who cheat even when you have rules. Hundred yeah. percent. That's the way it is, right? So in, in every election, you'll have cheating. In every business, you'll have cheating, and you have all these laws to protect from fraud. But it still happens. You still have a Bernie Madoff, right? And you still have things that 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 don't go right. In right, that's the reality of life. That doesn't change the the fact that um, you have to set certain standards and certain rules. Um, uh, just in Judaism, the basic rule, and I, I've repeated this many times in class, when it comes to sexual impropriety, okay, there's no one, no one, no one who's trusted. A man and a woman who are not married have no business being alone together, just the two of them. None. It doesn't make a difference if it's doctor and patient, which today, by the way, they're very careful about. My wife goes, to, they have, always have a nurse in the room. They will always make sure. And you know what? I spoke to a rabbi. I spoke to a rabbi who's a rabbi in one of the big schools in New York. And I asked him, I asked him, what are you doing? What's that, Howard? Sorry, mistake. Okay, no problem. Uh, so uh, I asked him, what are you guys doing to child-proof or adult-proof your school? He said, our school has a camera in every single room, every single hallway, the entrance for every bathroom. Every square inch of that building is video, is, is video, has videos that are running 24-7. And there's no, there's no, and he says, you know who demanded it? The rabbis, the teachers. The teacher said, I'm an upstanding citizen. I All I care about is taking care of my students, right? I, I don't need some kid coming, you know, and saying that I did something in, inappropriate. And I'm not, what are you going to say? Oh, with the smoke, there's fire. It has to be he's guilty. I want a video camera. I'm not teaching in the school unless you have video cameras in my room. To protect the yeah. teachers, yeah. the teachers demanded it, and I think it's it's something we need to really, really uh, take very seriously. As that that there's a certain there's a certain you know I there's a story I heard recently of a rabbi after this story happened, the rabbi who approached a friend of mine, and he said to him, "This is not even in the United States; it's in a different country." He said to him, "I'm a teacher in a school." And um, I have uh, desires and temptations. What do I do? Right. And so I, I don't want to be. I don't want to fall into the trap. Um, I, I, and uh, he asked this. This is a, a fellow student of my rabbi. He asked my rabbi. My rabbi said, "Encourage him to get a different job. He has to leave the school immediately." Right. Don't leave him in a place. Don't say, well, you know, it's like it's like you take someone who's a, a former alcoholic and you tell him, can you be a bartender? Right? It's not a good place for them to hang out. Right? He's going to have temptation. Get him out of his environment. Change his environment. He's got to be in a different place because of that temptation that he has. Right? It doesn't, doesn't make him an evil person for having temptation. But we have to know that these, these are realities and Especially again, we're living in a world that is so hypersexualized. Yeah. It is so pervasive and, and, and in your face. Mm -hmm. Right? So if a person isn't healthy one hundred percent healthy, they can fall into a trap. That's not that's not gonna, not a good one. And we need to we need to realize that this is it's a dangerous, dangerous uh situation if we don't Acknowledge the um, the dangers. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get back to our. Where are we up to? Ooh, we ran over time. Yeah. I'm sorry, we didn't even finish the halacha. We'll get back to it next week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, well, we'll take a, a few minute break. Uh, anybody want cold water? There's cold water. There's coffee. Oh, I, I forgot my coffee in the car. All right, and I will send out the the uh, parsha. Uh, review in about two minutes. Okay, so you check your emails in two minutes and you will have it sitting in your inbox.
Mm-hmm. Howard, how are you? I haven't seen you in a while. And I'm good. so great to see you. I've just What's been, that? Uh, I'm waiting for Omicron to dissipate, which is coming soon. And then Aren't I'll be, we all? Aren't then, we all? Then I'll be back live. Just waiting. I'm looking, I'm looking forward. Thank you. Hey, how are you? Welcome back. Rabbi? Yes. I'm sorry about last night. I didn't mean to run out. Did you get my text? I did. I did. I got I your text. I apologize. No, it's but no problem. Come I on. I was it's... very happy to be back at the Torch Center. It was it great. It was great. So good. Thank it you was, so much. It was absolutely delightful to see you. <laughs> Okay, I'm just uh, okay. So. And yes, sure. Okay, I'm going to do a four and five. I think Judaism is the only religion that had women leaders. The only one. Who? Give me. The Amazons. Okay, we have it. I'm going to send it now to. Okay, Anna. Anna Stone. And Eliza. And Bobby. And Howard. And Anne. After I was working at Northwest Corporate Job, I wanted to get a new car. And, and they went out to have a good time back. And they said, Well, did you ever have a little bit of a car? Yeah. 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 Ye
She knew. Let it go. She knew that was what she said. And I know that I asked you for it. And believe me, I want to tell you again. Even though it's not the first time. Right. The second one. She wasn't the one that would just do anything. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the money to convert? Well, that's what you and I talked about. Mm-hmm. And then I have to read that. Yeah. Well, Bruce and uh, uh, Ellen, they had to convert that. Did they um, convert it? And they had to read that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a challenge. You know, it's a challenge. So they didn't give us a book of one of Wanted to get, I understand. Oh, okay. that's <laughs> Jewish. But does that mean? And they were Jewish. Why did they have to get married? Well, I, it's, I, I think the same reason my nephew was having two marriages. He eloped during COVID for his first marriage, and they want to have a religious marriage. Well, that's from little, Canada. Is that different, though? I don't think it's any different. Okay. I think <laughs> it's just a religious ceremony. And then no. it was it. And I think that's the same with conversion. It's a non-religious ceremony if you're not the same, and then it becomes a religious ceremony if you are. I think that's certainly understandable. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I, I I just see that as secular and religious you know, these, ceremony. These conversions are a gain to many people. I know. I know two people recently mm-hmm. that women. Converted to Judaism, got married to their Jewish spouses. They got a divorce, mm-hmm. and then the uh, the woman marries a, a Gentile and becomes Christian. Well, that's, that's well, you know what? Though? That's probably because that was another person who only converted to get married. Right. That's the difference. Exactly. You know. Thank you, Rev. That's the difference. You know, and that's what's wrong with with some a lot of those. Exactly. Because you have to want to do it. The girl who comes on Monday night is that. What's it? So if you can, yeah, I mean, uh, some women can run prior to ever finding somebody, Uh, and then they're already converted. Yeah. so she brings that other girl. Yes, yes, yes. I was interested. What's going on? Here. Oh, he has three books about Judaism. Three? Yeah, I only know of one. Yeah, I mean, it was already there. Three. Yeah. 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 Yeah.